so this video is a little bit different. I typically like to have a well-prepared presentation with slides and keeping it concise and to the point after conducting thorough research. But I'm also constantly reading a lot of different things and then kind of just moving on. So I thought that I would maybe try to start sharing some of his smaller chunked pieces and just to do it, just to share it. I don't really have a clear goal with this YouTube channel besides just it being a place where I could share what I'm learning about, what I'm researching, and some of my insights and analysis. So I recently read a book called Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Now, I didn't actually read the whole book because here's the thing, if you've ever read any of these older classical Western philosophy writers, it's super dense. It is like a mental hike up a mountain. You have to really concentrate and focus to first understand what they're saying and then to actually contemplate the abstractions and think about it logically. So, and I did that throughout college actually. I was a philosophy minor. I almost majored in it, but then I decided not to once I realized the limitations of Western philosophy, really of all philosophies, but especially in the Western sense. So I began exploring other areas. In any sense, since college, I haven't really gone back to those classical philosophers. And what I mean by classical philosophers is, you know, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, that time period. And of course, philosophy has been around for thousands of years. It goes back it, it's actually used to be a discipline that was held in the highest regard and that's where the term PhD comes from the word philosophy and of course that's changed over times and but it continues to today and really philosophy is looking at how can we use reason logic and the, those principles to understand our reality and our the world so the reason it's interesting to look back at those so-called classical philosophers is that they shaped a lot of what the foundation became for modern thought in the Western world. And by Western world, we mean Europe and America, basically. And so you've got this group of guys, and they're sort of looked at as like these forefathers of philosophy, just like we have those forefathers in the different scientific fields that established certain principles, and then everyone kind of worked off those and debated. And like with everything there's pros and cons to that kind of a system kind of building on like in physics people build on einstein and newton you know it's the same way in philosophy so that's the context for you here with who Immanuel kant is he's one of those guys and he wrote this book critique of pure reason in 1781 and it's an 800 page book so i'm not going to sit down and read that book but I am curious about what Kant said and why people hold him in high regard and I want to take his thoughts and then put them into context and reflect on them for myself and into the bigger tapestry of this whole mystery of what it, what is reality, what is the universe, what's our experience of consciousness. So I had heard on a podcast recently about some of these apps where they'll take a dense long work and condense it down into something you can read in under an hour, like key points, ideas, and a summary. So, and on one side, yeah, you can be skeptical, which I was part of me, and like, oh, is that just going to tarnish this person's work? You're not going to really understand it. But at the other side, I'm open to it, and I think it's very possible to condense something down into something you can digest in an hour, and then know the arguments, the research, what the person was putting forth without having to spend oh, who knows how long it would take me to read 800 pages of this kind of writing and if I would even to what degree I'd really accurately comprehend it so for this kind of stuff I think it's great maybe for anything but this was my first try I tried this app one of these apps called uh, Blinkist and just thought I'd give it a shot and you can see here this is the book the Immanuel Kant critique of, critique of Pure Reason, and it did take me about 45 minutes. So I did that last night, and then I, I just, I was inspired by it actually to connect his ideas to some of my own and some of the more modern 
field of speculating about reality and everything else. So I wrote an article, and um, it's in a link in the description below, and I figured for this, rather than just post it on my website and never talk about it again, I, I thought I'd do a quick 10, 15 minutes here of just sharing it. I do invite you to go read the article. Um, I kind of just wrote it this morning. but So I'm going to try to, in the next like five to seven minutes, give you the real concise breakdown of what Kant's saying and then my two cents onto it and what it has to do with psychedelics. Obviously, you see the mushrooms there. So Kant's basically saying, when he wrote this in 1781, he's saying, hey, look, philosophy, he's focusing on metaphysics. And what metaphysics is in philosophy is a term that means trying to scientifically study and understand truths about reality outside of physical, material, empirical evidence. Things like a soul, things like what happens when you die, those kind of things that we're not going to be able to prove with art science. That's metaphysics in one sense. So he says, rather than just engaging in metaphysics and philosophy, we should, we should think and try to analyze, is our mind, is our mental capacity for reasoning fit? Is it possible for it to even comprehend metaphysics, to even come to understand any truths about metaphysics? So should we even be engaging in that, in philosophy, in a scientific way? And in order to do this, he says, we've got to look at the actual mental machinery of our mind. And so he breaks our mental machinery into three components in his conception of this. First is sensibility, which is the most primal, basically just sensory input, right? Looking, we have our three-dimensional space here. And, and our mind, our, our mental machinery is, is taking in that data. That's step one, right? Whether it's hearing, feeling, touching, the senses. Consciousness is taking that in at that very basic level. And that's the first component of this mental machinery that we have. Now, the next step is what he calls understanding. And these are these very fundamental concepts that allow us to make sense of any of this. For example, very basic things like even space and time. We have to have that conceptual template before we, we can look and say, oh, the picture is, is above the couch. You know, if we don't have those concepts, we're just seeing colors and lines and there's nothing else to it. So the second layer of our mental machinery is those concepts, very basic ones, which in Kant argues that they're there already. They're like templates. For example, something like either or. You know, you're either dead or alive. If you're dead, that means you're not alive. If you're alive, that means you're not dead. That's almost like baked into the template of our mental capacities. Because, and without those very basic building blocks, like that example, you can't have these more complex and abstract building blocks, which then lead into reasoning. Kind of the third component that he identifies, these more abstract, complex ways of using these building blocks of basic concepts and understandings into a larger framework, which has allowed us to do things like build advanced technology or communicate on these very high levels and understand in abstract language and all that. So in breaking that down, one of his key points here is that there are two kinds of knowledge in his system. What he calls a priori knowledge and then knowledge that we obtain through our reasoning. Now, a priori knowledge is knowledge that exists independent of our experience of it. In our, something akin to universal truths, universal laws that are not dependent on our ex conscious experience of it. For example, 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 2 is 4 no matter what, right? We don't have to be there witnessing and experiencing the two things, my two fingers and these two fingers, and then that's 1, 2, 3, 4. You know, you could take any item that's a basic solid item and add two and two, it's going to be four. And that's going to be constant, right? Now, 
we are not innately we do not innately have that a priori knowledge that constant universal truth of two plus two is four we have to come to learn it through a process of understanding concepts and reasoning addition right first you have to understand the concept that this is a thing this is an entity and that now you have to understand the concept of addition right and then we get to the point where two plus two is four and that's a universal truth independent of our conscious experience but we had to use our conscious experience to get there so that's the basic framework of what he then goes on to say in in the crux of his final conclusion and argument is that we can only understand reality as it relates to our mental machinery and our processing of the data of reality and so that doesn't mean that we're understanding reality itself we're just understanding what appears to us to be universal laws such as 2 plus 2 is 4 <coughs> as it relates to our mental processing and so that's his ultimate conclusion is that with our ability to reason we're only ever going to get these truths and laws that are relative to our processing and conscious experience of the reality they're not we will not know if they're actually fundamental to the reality itself. So, I fundamentally agree with Kant, and in the yes, in the sense that our mind and consciousness, as we know it right now, is not capable of comprehending what is the nature, the ultimate nature of reality. But I disagree with Kant because Kant says we should abandon this pursuit altogether, which I don't agree with because I think even if we can't perceive the ultimate truth of what's the ultimate nature of reality with our mind and consciousness just because you can't get 100 percent something that doesn't mean that you should abandon it, it all together we can expand we our consciousness we can evolve and that's where i drew in the connection with psychedelics something that i'm curious how what kant would think about terence mckenna who was a psychedelic researcher that spoke a lot in the 1980s and 90s his whole, one of the crux of his arguments was what's the potential of increasing our understanding of reality through perturbing consciousness. Perturbing means through some outside force changing the basic mechanisms, processes, and systems. So in Kant's system of how the mental machinery works, what if we change that through something like psychedelic plants, like mushrooms? We're changing that underlying mechanism then can we perceive more can we have a greater understanding of the ultimate reality outside of our normal mental machinery and it doesn't need to be just psychedelics it could be meditation it could be spiritual practices and also what would Kant think about psychic abilities which have been suppressed and are, have not given the official stamp of authority as being real but there's plenty of a paper trail to see and that it's real and you could even experience it yourself, what will Kant think of things like remote viewing and telekinesis, clairvoyance, telepathy, right? These phenomena indicate that there's, we don't quite understand the relationship between reality and our mind. What if they're intertwined, right? So I think it's interesting to contrast the psychedelic phenomena and the psychic phenomena with these basic conclusions of Kant that our mental apparatus is not capable of knowing or what the nature of reality is in itself and I think that's ultimately true and that's what the ancient Egyptian mystery schools of Thoth which became the Hermetic and the Hermetic principles the first principle is the all is unknowable and I've even come to this conclusion way back in the day when I was like 17 18 years old contemplating reality that to me just made sense oh we just can't understand we just can't comprehend it we're not capable of but and I think that's fundamentally true but it doesn't mean that we can't perceive more of it and that we can't merge more with ultimate reality and come to know it and come to experience it through altering our consciousness or perhaps other means just evolution over time so these are the kind of thoughts that 
I raised. Be curious if you have any thoughts on this. I know this isn't a UFO video, but I don't really want the channel to just be about UFOs. To me, it's all this huge tapestry of what what's going on here. The UFO issue is very a very key part of that right now, especially with what what's going on in the history of it right now and the implications of it and all of that. So I tend to focus a lot of my time on, on studying that, but it's all connected and I do think things like the psychedelic experience is is maybe a little bit overlooked in this whole thing. It's easy to write it off. Well, that's t you know, it's taboo. Well, it's it's drugs. It's not real. But you know, that's another thing that's been suppressed because the studies are out there, the research is out there. People when it's done in the right way, people have these kind of experiences of experiencing a, a greater reality, a connection, um, a personal healing when it's done in a, in a responsible way, in a good set and setting. So I think it's, it's a key piece to the puzzle. And in any sense, it's just fun to compare these old 18th century philosophers with kind of what we know now and curious what they would think about all this. So yeah, I will just keep kind of putting these out if it seems like something that uh, is valuable, I guess, for myself and I guess for the small audience here of expanded knowledge. But I know it may turn some people off because maybe you're here for the UFOs or whatever, but it's all connected. And ultimately, the point of expanded knowledge is to go wherever it goes and try to tie it all together. So hopefully it's ain't too far out there for you even if it is hey that's okay so thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next one